So as you've seen, most people know that there's a new version of the Omicron variant. It's starting to get the attention of scientists, health professionals, and the cleaning industry. So key indicator shows that we need to keep our eye on this. It is called the BA.2, or some call it the stealth variant. So I'm scary. I know Omicron this sounds scary enough. Now we have a stealth. So I don't know what that really is going to look like in the future, in the next few weeks. But today we're with Patty Olinger, my co-host, and John Cordier. We're going to talk about this subvariant. So Patty, why don't you get us started with um, some thoughts, some things you've seen lately? Oh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, you know, I mean, everybody definitely is dealing with pandemic fatigue. We're done. Um, and I've, I've been to so many meetings recently where people said, I'm vaccinated, I've worn my mask, I'm ready to throw the mask away and just be done with this. Um, and so many people with Omicron have been infected and they have like, you know, really what I've heard, mild cold-like symptoms. I also know people who have had Omicron, even though they're vaccinated and been down for a few days. So this virus is not done with yet. And it will most likely be with us for, you know, a lot of people are predicting kind of like the flu, where we see it over and over. But the BA2 or, or the stealth Omicron um, is one thing that we need to take a look at and really be careful because what we're seeing and what people are starting to wonder about is that age group, again, 65 and older, or people who are immunocompromised. And as we're, you know, going down, you know, the time-wise from our last booster, you know, are we, you know, do we need to be careful? Is our immunity getting down? And do we need to pay more attention to this. We're seeing spikes in other countries of this particular variant. And it is something that is, is definitely we need to keep our eye on. And with us, as you indicated, is John um, from Epistemics. And I'm really excited to have him here with us today. And John, what are your thoughts on, on this particular variant? Um, thanks, Betty. Glad to, to be back on. Um, as we look at this variant and the eventual other ones that will come up, uh, to your point exactly, these things are going to be like the flu, where each flu season, the, the virus looks slightly different. Uh, that's going to be no different for COVID. Um, most, of our, most of what people consider the flu are like one of the four existing common cold coronaviruses that likely every person on the planet has been exposed to since they were maybe four years old or by the time they were four years old. Um, so as we look at the different variants, it's important to understand if this new, if any of the new variants are changing things like uh, the way that they attack the body or um, if they're evading our immune response, or if they're coming through and like sticking around longer. And how do we look at this from a terms of transmissibility and what protocols need to be put in place to prevent further transmission? Um, so I would look at, you know, one, one question to ask for any variant as we look at the seasonal patterns of, of COVID would be, is this variant altering the disease or altering symptoms? And what do I mean by that is maybe there's a variant that instead of impacting uh, the lungs and the respiratory tract, it goes into another organ system. Um, that would be uh, a not so great scenario because all of our vaccines are designed right now for protecting us against um, earlier variants that would be mainly in the respiratory system. Another um, type of scenario when we're looking at variants and a question to ask is, is this variant coming off of a human like um, subvariant, or is this more of a recombinant type of coronavirus? Um, in viruses like the flu or HIV and even other coronaviruses, uh, sometimes you get genetic recombination between what is being spread in a human strain and then in areas that humans are interacting closely with livestock. Um, there are strains that give the animals, and sometimes those combine and create new strains on their own. So the important thing to look at when we're considering any of the new variants is where did it come from? What's its genetic makeup? And is it changing the way that the virus interacts with our immune system and um, 
you know, what, what, what's the, the level of severity of, of illness that can arise from it? Yeah, that's a really good point because I think um, I'm sure you've, you've heard or, or read about the, there's a strain that they believe is a combination of Delta and Omicron in, in, a, in some other countries that probably originated with somebody who was co-infected and that then was spread. Um, and when we start seeing those types of things, like you indicated in the very beginning, you don't know how dangerous it is, how infectious it is, how, how lethal it may be. And as we learn, um, you know, as we've learned from other variants, some of these like Delta um, can be very detrimental and then things that we need to really put things in place. What's interesting to me is the response that we have from a layered standpoint stays pretty much the same um, for at least these variants. And it's one of those things that are lessons that we've learned. We need to keep that in mind. Certainly. And when we have the, the seasonal, like the predictive seasonal patterns across the United States, across Europe, across Asia, South America, the layered approach, we, you're really trying to match what needs to be put in place for that season. And knowing that at the early summer in the United States, this is where we're going to see the new variant that emerges elsewhere in the world because travel's opened up, there's more interactions going on. It leads to the further emergence of and transmission of these new variants that we're going to experience. So as we pick up what's going on, or we pick up the variant that comes from Europe or wherever else, we need to be looking at what these other countries are doing, what protocols that they have in place, and how serious of um, an illness were, were their populations um, experiencing. So all, all this is to say is, depending on the month of the year and the location of where you are living, where you're traveling to, there are common layers that you can put into place. You're going to hope that workplaces, event centers, schools keep cleaning protocols in place, keep air, air filtration as something that is going to always be improving. The other side of that is there might be times of the year where it just becomes common. Hey, it's no, November, December time frame, and I'm in Chicago. All right, I'm going to wear a mask when, when I'm going out and about during this time of the year. And those things just become as normal as putting on a coat or a sweater, whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, I, I think the the seasons of disease that we're seeing from COVID, we're now being able to predict those in a much finer level of granularity and much more detail. And then we just have to match the safety protocols on top of that. And that, that's how we're going to live with this until COVID truly does become endemic, meaning within all of us globally. And that's that's going to prevent seeing the high spikes and um in hospitalizations and deaths as well. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting. I mean, we've you know we've really um, our mantra, you might say, or or our messages has been a layered approach, or you know, a scalable response based on the risk assessment or what's going on at the given time, or or your own personal situation, whether you're immunocompromised, um, you know, with airborne pathogens. We know that you know, air is important and focusing on that indoor air quality and healthy spaces is critically important for prevention. Um, we also know that surfaces do matter and that we don't know the percentage. It's harder to quantify sometimes the percentage of infections that come from touching a contaminated surface and then touching our eyes, nose, and mouth, for example. But we know that there is a percentage of that. Um, there was a recent study that I think came out of the University of Hong Kong that talked about Omicron staying on surfaces, you know, and remaining more infectious longer than other variants. And it's one of those things that we do need to pay attention to that. And, you know, obviously it's near and dear to my heart from a standpoint of looking at the entire picture of that risk assessment and layered approach, what we can control ourselves, like you indicated, wearing a mask, like a coat, um, getting our vaccines when they are available, um, washing our hands, but also from a business standpoint, ensuring that we have proper protocols in place, whether it's for our HVAC systems 
or our cleaning and disinfection procedures in a, again, scalable um, layered approach. Yeah. And as you add these approaches and layers on top of one another, it isn't just protection around COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Like how many other diseases are we preventing and how are we also improving the well, the health and well being of people coming into our workplaces, coming into event centers, all of those things are also important to consider. Um, I think COVID shines a light on a need to improve those things. Um, that, that's been revealed from an equity lens. Uh, it's been revealed from a facilities upgrade type lens across the board, regardless of industry. But looking at maintaining these types of protocols and assuring that they're being put in place at the right time of the year with what's happening in that population is important. So um, on one of the earlier calls, we talked about some solutions might just be at a point in time, whereas others are over a duration of time. And again, we're you know, last summer when events just started like opening up um, my team. And I think you guys were also working with the city of Las Vegas, the Las Vegas convention center, looking at um, the world of concrete. And that was able to go on. It was at a trough in the epidemic, but later on in the summer, cases started increasing over the fall cases started increasing again. And if, if we, as people were like, look back a year, it's like, Oh, we kind of went through this last year mm -hmm. and we also did the year before. And so getting to think like, all right, this isn't going to be over. We're just at a period of this time interval where cases are going to be lower or dropping. And then we're going to be in another period where they're increasing and just matching what we're doing in our own personal choices. And then what businesses have to do to respond to that from a business continuity perspective, from a resilience perspective. And it, it, it all comes back to what we've been talking about for a year now, these layered approaches right at the right time um, in the right places. I know that uh, we talk about the cleaning, disinfecting, masking up, everything we've been doing. And most of us have had our, our vaccinations and our booster. Um, no, nope, there's not much talk about the next vaccination or the next booster. Any thoughts there? Is that something that we could see coming out pretty soon as far as new information? Certainly. Um, the importance of getting the booster, it's a little bit different than the flu because a lot of us have been exposed to the flu at some point in our lives previously. Well, now we're working with like a new, a new virus. And so it is important to get your booster shot when it becomes available, specifically for those who are high, at, in higher risk categories, those who are um, older than 65 or possibly immunocompromised if you are able to get a vaccine. Um, in, yeah, I think across the United States, looking at there's a smaller group of people that have had three shots versus two, all of that's going to contribute to more cases, more hospitalizations, and the greater likelihood of increased deaths across the country. And if we're going to get past the, the media picking these things up and caring with them, and that impacts behaviors for consumers, behaviors for people showing up at events, um, you getting, getting your booster shot when it's available to you is a, a very important thing to do. So is there anything else that the cleaning industry or business owners should know at this point um, obviously this is all developing as we speak every day. There's some new information. I know John on your blog, you have some information about the forecast of the second quarter of 2022, anything that we should talk about. So I, I'll, I'll say, um, for the business owners and, you know, for our star facilities, what we talk about is, um, it, it, please do look at the epistemics, um, the forecast. I mean, that really does help you look at things from a standpoint of planning and to keep in mind what, you know, th that will change over time as we learn more information, as we get closer to a certain time period. The other thing that a lot of um, our STAR facilities um, are starting to look at is ESG. Um, what are those measures and metrics that you have that what we do with um, cleaning, disinfection, infection prevention really has components that fit into those measurable things that we have typically looked at with sustainability and that for resilient facilities. And if we look at the UN, what they called sustainable development goals, those went beyond those 
um, green chemistries and everything. It went into health and wellness, hygiene, sanitation, and other aspects of overall wellness that people in our star facilities are starting to ask and that we're starting to develop. What are those measurable things that can fit into overall business planning? And I think that those are really important for businesses to start thinking about how do you incorporate this for the future? Because even if, even if COVID completely went away, COVID-19, and we never saw it again, there will be another pandemic at some point in time. We just don't know when. And John, this um, blog post, the COVID-19 forecast, I'll put that link in our video description. So I assume that's okay. So people can uh, stay up to date with that. Anything to add? Um, I mean, looking at the future of work or the future of attending events is really kind of a, a frame that we're starting to, to put this into. So in, in schools, for example, school district superintendents and school boards, they've also had to be weather forecasters. If they were able to identify, all right, we have a big storm coming on Wednesday and Thursday of this week, we're going to close schools that day, they would likely want to put that information out as soon as they had it. Well, in today's world, that's usually the morning of at four or 5 a.m. Well, when we're looking at a disease forecast, these are things that are more predictable on a longer time scale than something like the weather. So a weather forecaster is not going to be able to say it's going to be 75 degrees and sunny four months out from now. They can say, yeah, it probably will be with some range of certainty. But what we're seeing from a disease perspective is that the, the time of the year by city you can see, all right, here's likely when it's going to peak. Here's likely when it's going to be down. And I would look at this from a business continuity perspective or designing the office, the events of the future. And as you're able to forecast this out, you're looking at maximizing for health, but also minimizing stressors for people. And when you're doing those two things, you're creating a safe environment. You're providing trust and assurance to people who are gathering in the spaces um, I think that's an important thing for business owners to business owners, school districts, um, event organizers to to consider going forward. One, one, I have one more question. Then Patty, you can wrap it up if you'd like. But is there anything that's that uh, we know about that we're not seeing in the mainstream media about all this? Yeah. No, I, th I think that the one thing that that was probably fit into that is the strain that was a recombination of Delta and Omicron. You don't see a lot about that. Um, okay. But that is something that's a little bit disconcerting when we start seeing some of these re and the other thing that John brought up is the whole aspect of the recombination between human and animal health um, is that we will see, and we already know that there is some, there are COVID infections in animals right now. Um, and what that will do in that recombination, that zoonosis aspect, we're not sure yet.